Happy Christmas Eve, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com Mailbag Podcast presented by Blue Water Climate Control. Be sure and check them out at BlueWaterClimateControl.com. I mentioned this on the Tuesday podcast. Great promotion starting for them in January. Uh, it's on the, um, the ductless system. Uh, it's just a fantastic little unit. If you're looking for something that is quiet and you're trying to heat or cool a small area, this is perfect. They got the 9,000 BTU for $1,600, the 12,000 BTU for $1,800. It's perfect for sunrooms, bonus rooms, your garage, um, it, an office or studio, or anything like that. It, it's a fantastic little unit. Uh, my mom's got one in her sunroom. It works absolutely fantastically. They got special financing on it. Uh, you can give them a call at 865-299-2290 to get more details on it or check them out online for all the latest on this special promotion. And don't forget, for any of your HVAC needs, Blue Water Climate Control can take care of you. With Austin Price and Rob Lewis, Merry Christmas, guys. Hope everyone is doing well out there today. Plenty of questions to get to. We'll dive right into them. And out of the gate, this should be one, I guess we'll start with you, AP, here. One of the best recruiting class, one of the best in-state recruiting classes in a while. How does Tennessee land any of these guys by bringing Pruitt back? What's he going to sell? We know it's not wins, player development, or playing time. How do we bring in quality assistance when Jeremy Pruitt is on the hot seat? Uh, we've seen this play out with Dooley and Butch Jones. Let's start with this recruiting class, Austin, and, and let's go bigger picture here. Um, Obviously, we know where where he stands with Jeremy Pruitt at this point. But how big is this class in the state in in the state for twenty twenty two? I think it's it's as big of a class as as Tennessee's had, um, and and they've had some good ones in recent years. I mean, you go back to twenty seventeen, you know, that was a really good class. That was the you know class that that featured T Higgins and featured Amari Rogers and featured uh, Jacob. Uh, um, kid that ended up going to LSU, you know, you know um, Stevens at Oakland who went to LSU, um, you know, it had a, had a ton of players in it. Um, I think this is one's ever bit as good. I mean, we, we start with Ty Simpson. Obviously, Walter Nolan's a transplant moving across the state line. And we'll see if he stays out there and plays his senior year for Marlon Walls or not. There's some scuttlebutt that he may or may not. You know, just because that's not a winning program, and I'm not sure he wants to beat his head into the brick wall again, um, losing. Um, but uh, you know, you, you know, you, you throw in Isaiah Horton, Jordan James, Dallin Hayden, Cam Miller, the Wade twins, Fisher Anderson. I mean, you can just go right to Cody Jones. You can go right down the line. There's a ton of really good players in this state in 2022. <clears throat> he brings up a good point. He brings up a good question. You know, I mean, like you know, I. If you're one of these kids, you know, how, how much can, how much faith can you put in a place that's not won, you know, the last, you know, couple of years? And I mean, we, we and, and not, and not that much over the last decade. I mean, I just want to keep it centralized to the last couple of years. I mean, you know, Tennessee went five and seven his first year, eight and five, and then of course three and seven. So, um, you know, I, I, I totally get the question. I think it's very valid. And, uh, you know, it, it, it all starts with the quarterback position. It all starts with Ty Simpson. And, uh, you know, to me, he, he, he is the end-all, be-all in, in that class for, for, uh, for the state of Tennessee. Because if you get him, I think there's some natural additions you add because some kids want to play with him. He knows all those kids. He, you know, he's played on the Tennessee Select 7-on-17 seven seven with Isaiah Horton and Jordan James and Dallin Hayden and Cam Miller. I mean, he talks to those kids a lot. And, um you know, I I don't think you can understate how how important that class is on the whole. When you look at the last ten years, the best team Tennessee's had in the last ten years has been centrally located or centrally cored by by in state kids. When you talk yep. about Butch's best year with Josh Malone and Derek Barnett and Jalen Hurd and Todd Kelly Jr. and Jay Sean Robertson and on and on and on. So obviously this is an important class. Rob, let me ask you this from a recruiting standpoint with the one-time transfer rule going through, let's just say the SEC is going to adopt it. The pressure's on them for adopt it. Do kids make less of a quote business type decision in recruiting now and more of a kind of an emotional decision because they know they've got an out, they can transfer. Is it, is their decision maybe not as thought provoking for them because it's not necessarily quote a four year or five year decision 
as it's always been because it's been so hard to transfer? I, I think what it does is it makes it more likely for a kid to maybe pick a spot where the depth front of his position is crowded and he goes in and, you know, sees, sees how things work out that first year, gets a feel for it, and um, then decides, you know, after freshman year, once he's there, once he's got the lay of the land, uh, that, that he can bounce after that year. I, I, I don't think – I think it makes playing time, you know, not maybe maybe not quite as important. That's that's kind of my initial take. Yeah, I, I agree with Rob on this. I, I couldn't totally I couldn't agree more. I mean, when you look at it, Brent, if you're a kid and you're let's say you're two finalists for Tennessee and Alabama, and you know, just okay, let's just let's use Ty as the example. Ty really likes the place that is Knoxville, but he knows that the program's not been succeeding, and he's really torn. Doesn't it make sense to go ahead and pick Alabama and go down there, see how it plays out? Maybe, you know, maybe Alabama ends up recruiting past high with a guy in 2023 and, 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 the, and the playing time just doesn't match up. And, you know, you know, then he's able to come back versus, or, you know, maybe he goes in there and, and surpasses the guy that's on the depth chart already and becomes a starter and is like takes off and, you know, the rest is history. Point is, I think it makes it a lot easier to take a risk. The the risk, the safe pick, will become not the trendy option in recruiting. It, they the risky pick will become the trend, in my opinion, because the kids can always bounce back to the safe option. Which and it also goes back to the fact that something we talked about, and I talked about it with a former player the other day, is there will be no de recruiting you'll have to continue to recruit these kids. And I think it's just, it sets up to be a total, uh, a total game changer with this one-time transfer. All right, let's go to the next question here. Have you seen any players in the transfer portal that could possibly be players to watch to fill some of the open spots that Tennessee has left and also your favorite Christmas candy or snack? I'm not sure how many people care about what our favorite Christmas candy or snack is, but let's talk about players to watch in the portal. We saw Tennessee um, offer the defensive tackle from Iowa State, who who transferred, went to the portal. So there's one name there potentially. Obviously, Austin, a quarterback is where it's going to be for Tennessee. Uh, it's one of the places they would like to go. You mentioned um, the, the the kid from Houston Baptist's name as, there really as that. well. Any other any other name? Well, people asked right about there? Jamie Robinson on the board hubs, and 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 you yeah. know if Jeremy Pruitt and Shelton Felton are here, I think Tennessee would have an option there. But you know he's had a really pretty strong start to his career at South Carolina, so does he? You know, look to even go bigger than that. You know what I mean? Like just right. you know he's home state of Georgia or you know Alabama. I mean I'm you know again I think this lines up for when kids you know go to a, a place that isn't having a ton of success and they prove their worth for them to bounce to better programs. I, again, I, I still think that whether it be the one-time transfer or, um, or it's just, yeah, it's really just the one-time transfer, whether it's guys transferring from a school or recruits picking a school, I still think it benefits the schools that are winning. So I, I think it's, it's, it's set up for the teams that have won the last five, 10 years to continue to win. Anybody want to chime in on their, Favorite Christmas candy or snack? Yeah. Well, again, I'm, I'm a big Reese's guy, so I would love I love the Reese's trees. In fact, I just love the fact once we get to Halloween, we got the pumpkins, the trees, the hearts, and the eggs rolling right through Easter. Uh, if you're asking me, like, what do I? You know, I love when my grandmother makes oatmeal chocolate chip cookies. Rob, Rob Lewis, you you're jumping uh, pretzel, in here? Pretzels covered with white chocolate. Uh, see, my the go to in my in, in my world is a square pretzel with a Rolo melted on top of it with a pecan half. Those things are bad. I'm not really sure that's a Christmas candy, though. That might be an all-season. That, like, that may be like the Die Hard movie. That may be an all-seasons candy. As well. I'll also roll in there and throw in a peanut butter roll. So you like you just like peanut butter is what you're telling everybody. You're hey, not. All right, let's go to the next one. Randy Boyd and Dante Plowman in favor of making a change at head coach, uh, question mark. Fulmer says this is a four or five year rebuild. Does he think this team is going to magically get good in one year? What does he see in Pruitt uh, that helps him say that Jeremy Pruitt can win championships at Tennessee? I think here's what Philip Fulmer, I, I'm, I, I'm not speaking for Philip Fulmer, my opinion on what Philip Fulmer thinks. 
I think he believes that Jeremy Pruitt is a really good X's and O's coach. And I think he believes he's a really good grinder on the recruiting trail that pays dividends for Tennessee. And I think he feels like that quarterback play was a huge reason why this team struggled the way that they did. I don't think he suddenly thinks they're going to go win a championship and the rebuild is complete in four years. Um, but I think he feels like this team is probably better than what they were this year had they gotten better quarterback play. As for Plowman and Boyd, um, I think that's the million-dollar question, Rob Lewis. I think nobody knows where those guys stand because the sports media don't have relationships with those guys. They don't have a lot of sources surrounding those two because sports media people don't cover the academic side on a daily basis. And I don't think Randy Boyd and, and, and Chancellor Plowman speak to the media a whole lot about things. So I think that's the big unknown in all of this. I, I agree, and I lean towards thinking that they are at least – contemplating making a change because I think we would all agree Philip has Pruitt's back so right. if the administration was 100% certain then I think that this would all have been resolved and we wouldn't be you know ha have this deafening silence right now about what's going to happen all right next question what are the chances Caden Sauter gets any playing time next year and do you think Brian Mauer is going to transfer now we will be thin at the quarterback position next year Austin your thoughts on Salter potentially finding the field for the Vols and your thoughts on Brian Maurer being here and not being here. Uh, Brian Maurer's got uh, no chance of being here. Um, you know, I, I just don't see that, that happening. Um, Caden Salter, we'll see, you know, I, I think that he'll have every bit as good a chance as Harrison Bailey and or any potential transfer quarterback that Tennessee brings in. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you'll have equal footing there going into spring practice for, you know, and, uh, and again, we say going into spring practice, I, I just continue to work off the assumption until told otherwise that Jeremy Pruitt's Tennessee's football coach. And I think that's how Coach Pruitt's looking at it. You know, I mean, you know, do I think that it's a lock that he's back? No, I don't. I think that we'll see how all this stuff, un, you, know, un, un, you know, kind of unravels or, or you know, develops uh, coming out of this investigation. But right now he's Tennessee's football coach. So I'm going to talk about things leading in the future as if he's going to be here. So, yeah, I mean – I think that ultimately, you know, Caden Salter will have every bit as good a chance as anybody to come in here. And I think being a, a guy that's here in spring is huge. In the vein of Jeremy Pruitt being the coach next year, what's your gut telling you about the following possible – looking for possible candidates, defensive line coach, quarterback coach, O-line coach, linebacker coach, would really like to hear a few names that make some sense. Uh, let's go with the two opening positions at this point right now. You've mentioned, Austin, that – you think that there's a chance that Winky could be back and that he's certainly here now. Uh, same for Brian Niedermeyer. Don't know. I mean, I know his contract expires, but don't know what's going to happen there. You know they ha that there's two openings, right? D-line coach and the O-line coach. We've, well, talked, we've talked about D-line names, right? A, a pretty good bit. Uh, with a couple of those NFL guys, I think it's going to be interesting to see. I don't think Rodney Garner's coming here, but what does he do at Auburn? And then on the O-line coach, um, any names rumbling around out there? Well, three come to mind. Um, you know, I, I saw somebody on the board post, like, you know, some candidate, potential candidates that, you know, Pruitt's got some ties to. I, I think, you know, one, Ryan Pugh, who was at BYU, um, you know, play, you know, is from the state of Alabama. Um, I think he even played at Hoover. I think he's the OC at Troy, maybe. Um, he, he potentially could be a, an option. Um, he may also be an option for Auburn, um, you know, as, uh, as their new coach looks to, uh, you know, get a kind of a Southern footprint with his staff because he has no Southern footprint. Um, and, you know, I, I look at, I've heard Jim Turner's name, who's with the Bengals, who used to be at Texas A&M, and, uh, and then Matt Moore, who is the offensive line coach for West Virginia. So those are three potential names to at least uh, pay attention to and, and watch. Ryan Pugh covered his recruitment. Rob, that means we're old. All right. That's just, that's all that that means. If you cover his recruitment, he might end up as a possible candidate to be an offensive line coach. Um, so there you go. I'm an old guy. Uh, any explanation as to why Tennessee struggled to get quality play in the defensive backfield? Uh, the, the DBs, especially safety, seem a bit slow. I'm at a loss because Pruitt Ansley have had so much success at other stops in their defensive backfield. Why has that unit struggled? Lastly, it's a copycat league. Most of the coaches seem to have the same ideas when it comes to offensive and defensive strategies. No, you guys aren't coaches, but you've seen plenty of ball of your own uh, to have your own opinions. What are a few strategies you would like to see change 
and you think could be advantageous for Tennessee. Uh, quick synopsis on the, the, the second question or the first question, Austin, about Tennessee's struggle to land some players in, in the defensive backfield, their struggle this year. We've talked about it a good bit. I do think the safeties are a step slow. I thought McCullough was the fastest he'd been all year the last two weeks of the season. Clearly the foot was better the last part of the season or the last couple of weeks than it was the, the first part of the season for sure. And it probably should have been because, I mean, they were never playing back-to-back weeks until – Tennessee got to that Florida game. I mean, basically they had, you know, what they play? One game, two games. They played two games from October 20th, you know, until until the Florida game. So, I mean, they had like two games in six weeks um, or five weeks. So, he had time to heal. Um, I don't know. It, it is befuddling the fact that they've not been able to land any top flight corners. I mean, like it really is. I, you know, y- y- you can't explain it to me. I mean, I, I just don't. I don't understand. I'll say this, Rob. I like Key Lawrence. I like. I yes. like. I like what I see there. He's not there yet, and I get that he's not completely there yet. But I like what I saw out of and, that one. And I thought Warren Burrell came on towards the end of the year. I thought. I mean, not not a superstar, but I mean, you could maybe start to see see a little something there. On the last question, I mean, this is not strategy or X's and O's, but unless you're surrounding him, your quarterback with elite personnel like Alabama is all the skill spots. I think a mobile quarterback is, is a must in, in college football. Now, and it doesn't have to be a pure dual threat guy. I mean, a guy like Nick's at Auburn that can, you know, move around and, and you can call some design runs with him. Say, so, you know, Burrow wasn't fantastic with his feet, but I mean, he could buy time. He could extend plays. And I think, I, I think that's a big deal in, in college football and in this league. And I think defensively, you got to have a guy who scares people off the edge, rushing the quarterback. I think you got to have, from a personnel standpoint, defensively, you got to have you got to have a pass rusher. I know everybody's throwing it early, and they're getting it out of their hands faster. But you've got to have on third down a guy who can cause some problems and get to the quarterback, which was obviously a huge, huge struggle uh, for Tennessee uh, this season. No question about that. All right, how serious is the link to Bailey Zapp? How do the Vols fill out uh, the now thin quarterback room? Uh, determining pra- factor in Pruitt returning. I think we've already talked about that in terms of the investigation. I think that's a key component in the next step in determining Jeremy Pruitt's future. And if Pruitt's back or not, how likely is it that Jason Simpson is on the staff in Knoxville you know, uh, last year? Or next year, excuse me. We'll see on the last part. I mean, again, I think, you know, to me, he's going to have to have more openings on the offensive side of the ball. One, you're not going to name Jason Simpson your O-line coach. And I don't think it's good business to name him a quarterback's coach. So if you got rid of Winky, like you you bring in – okay, let's play hypothetical. You bring in Jason Simpson here. What's, what's Caden Salter thinking at that point? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, like, I mean no matter what kind of year he has, I mean, like, you really go, you know, feel, you know, comfortable getting coached by the guy who likely is, you know, going to have his kid in the room if, if Jason's on staff here. You know, I, I just don't I, – I, I think if you hired Jason Simpson, it would have to be as a tight ends coach or a receivers coach or something like that. I do not think you can name him the quarterback's coach. I just think that that puts him in a tough spot, puts Ty in a tough spot, and puts everybody involved in a really tough spot. Uh, what was the next to last question, Brent? Um, he, he, I talked about it, about the term, determining factors on per, returning and then how serious is yeah, it to Bailey Zapp. Oh, I, the, the, the Bailey Zapp thing, I think that, you know, Zapp's got a lot of interest in Tennessee, but I think that, you know, the whole notion that this staff could get let go is, is something that, you know, he's got to be mindful of. And I think it hurt him. You know, I, this, the, you know, waiting, you know, to me, if this thing carries past, you know, the first week of January, that means Tennessee's going to wait until they've got a full grasp of this thing. I, to me, like that's just you know the timeline, just ma- the struggle to match up a timeline and hire a coach. If you if you decide to go in a different direction in, in January or February, to me is just different than because you know, most coaching searches are no- late November, early December. You know, I mean, what 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 kind of coach and and what kind of staff can that coach bring to me if you make a move deep into January or February? What are your thoughts on that? I, I, I don't disagree. I mean, I think it's harder. I mean, I think you can get a head coach, you know, because you can what get a guy to make a move. Get, but I think, I think, Rob, but, I mean, most of those guys, most people are going to get a renewed contract, okay? If you're on, 
you know, if you're down to one year on a contract, you're trying to buy somebody out of a contract, most of them are going to be in a rollover by February on a new deal at, at, a, at the current place they're at. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it presents some challenges if you're starting to try to put a staff together, uh, you know, at the end of January, the first of February, compared to doing something the, the first part of January. At least that's my belief. Coaches convention, of course, they won't have that this year, but I think it's a little bit more challenging, certainly more challenging in a, in a normal year. Yeah, I I don't have anything to add. I think Tennessee's going to be a tough spot the longer they drag things out. Yeah. All right, let's go to a hoops question here, Rob. Based on what you've seen so far, give some basketball predictions. You ready? SEC record, all SEC players, all American tournament seed. Go ahead. Go for it, man. You got them a one seed. You got two I mean, freshman All-Americans, three All-SEC on... players, and they're going to sweep the SEC, right? I mean, based off what I have seen right now, I think they they're favored in every SEC game except for the road trip to LSU. I mean, is that crazy? Uh, I mean, is that I, one I, guy going to referee that game? Well, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, I can really see him going sixteen and two. I mean, that, fifteen and three, no worse than fourteen and four. I'll be stunned. Uh, all SEC players. I tell you what, I think it'd be tough for Tennessee is I think they got so many dudes that that you know can play. I don't think anybody's gonna have great numbers. Okay, so. I, I think that's that's going to hurt him. I mean, Fulke's a preseason All SEC. I, I can see them having two. Um, you know, Victor Bailey looked like an All SEC guy tonight. Jaden Springer looked like an All SEC guy three nights ago. Um, and Fulkerson was second team All SEC last year. So, I, I'm possibility of two, but I would say also you know possibility of none. Although that's that's hard to, to think when I think they're they're going to be the best team in the SEC. So I would, yeah, and I think they get at least one. I mean, I think there's going to be somebody, but I mean, I think Rob brings up a great point. Like li- literally any given night, you know, you're going to have somebody rise up. But to me, the, is, the way they've played to this point through their first six games is, is kind of like I thought they would, where you've got a bunch of guys right around 11, 12, 9, 7, and you just got this huge, uh, you know, collaboration of points and that, and, and that kind of window of, for each guy. Yeah, like what the on Friday, they had six guys and double figures all in between 10 and 16 points. I mean, I think you could see that a lot. All right, let's go to, let's go to a couple. No All-Americans, one or two seed. All right. Um, let's say we don't win the national championship, which is easy to assume. Why did Tennessee lose in the tournament? In other words, what about this team could prove the reason that they didn't have quite enough to get the job done in March, knowing that March is crazy and unpredictable? Uh, you know, you never know what the – how the seeding plays out, bad matchup here or there. I guess I guess what he's asking is what could be a bad matchup for this team? I just I just think superior size. I mean, people, you know, team with six, you know, goes six ten, six nine in, in the post, and they're good players, not just you know, statues and rebounding. And you know, I mean two times this year, Josiah James, you know, you've had a guard be be your leading rebounder in, in, in two games. I mean, I'm not saying that's that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's unusual. And uh, uh, as for the last question, 15 seconds left in the Elite Eight, I guarantee you Rich drawing something up where Fulke gets a touch on the block and it's his option to, you know, either score or, or make a play out of it. And it goes, and it goes through Vescovi? Well, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, getting, getting it to Fulkerson yeah, and it goes out of Vescovi that. Vescovi gets it to Fulke. Fulke, you know, if the score is not there, he, he makes a play to, to somebody else. All right. Next question. When Fulmer hired Pruitt, did you feel he underestimated the vasking changing landscape in college football to a more offensive game because his top three choices were defensive guys? Seem like all the people would understand this because his lack of offense and demise uh, was the uh, first part of his problem in 2008. Listen, I, I was I was on. I'll take this question. I was on board. Uh, and believe that Tennessee needed to hire a defensive-minded coach. They needed the toughness of a defensive-minded coach. It's a defensive league. Um, I didn't see the points coming the way that they have with LSU last year and then what everybody's doing uh, this year in the league. I think it's cyclical. I I think at some point defenses will come back around and things will even out a little bit more. Uh, Right now it's certainly an offensive-minded league. I think a defensive-minded coach can win in this league with offense. See Nick Saban, he's obviously adjusted to it. I think you have to have a clear offensive identity, uh, which Tennessee doesn't. But I was on board and thought Tennessee needed a defensive-minded football coach when they went out and hired Jeremy Pruitt. Um, All right, this one's for you, Austin. Top three golf courses you played. What's in your bag? Best round, go. 
speed round here. Here we go. Top three courses oh. played. Well, Augusta would be one. Uh, well, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, go ahead. Hi hat. Name drop. Get it. Let's go. Oak, we got Oak, three to go. Oak, Oakmont would be two. Okay, there you go. Next one. And yeah, I, I like Tory Pines, man. I, anytime you can tee off and it's seventy, and you can play a four or five hour round, and it's still seventy, I, and with picturesque views and the marine layer. Okay, okay, um, we got it. We got it. There's your three. What's in your bag? Uh, it's straight tailor mades, except for my putter and a Scott, which is a Scotty Cameron. All right, and you you have a lease program, right? You change clubs like every two years, like twenty four months. You turn them in. Is that how that every, works? Uh, I I do trade clubs a lot. Yeah, <laughs> best round of golf you've played. Uh, show 67. That's my best round. Was it at any of your three favorite golf courses? No, those are, okay. two, there's a difference, there's a difference between playing, there's a difference between playing those kind of courses and playing, you know, you know, you know, my best round was a cat tells at Metaview in Kingsport, but I mean, like there's a difference between playing that and playing Oakmont or are you, are you suggesting at a club or you're suggesting a 67 at Clinchview is uh, not the same as, as, you can't you can't shoot sixty seven at at Augusta if you shoot sixty seven at Clinch Street. No, you're you're, you're 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 even your good shots are, uh, you know, are are you know put in tough spots at those golf courses. You know, everything is is magnified. You know, any kind of miss is magnified at, at, at an Atlanta Athletic Club or an Honors Course or wherever. Yeah, I miss them wherever I play, so it really doesn't matter to me. All right, if Pruitt you is don't back- play. If Pruitt is back next season, a lot has been said about what needs to happen to fix the offense. Uh, one of my main concerns is the back seven of the defense. We're awful in coverage this past season, constantly look confused. I think they have some talent back there, but what do you think needs to get done to fix the issues in the back seven? Rob Lewis, we'll roll with you first on this one. I think you need better players. I mean, that's, I, mean I don't need to be you know, smart aleck about it, but, I mean, we talked already. Uh, I mean, I think you need more speed at safety. For, for sure. I mean, I think Bryce Thompson, out, outside of that, I mean, I don't know that anybody had a really good year in, in the secondary. Would you I mean, Would you agree that anybody yeah. played at a, a a plus level? Yeah, I don't know that anybody in the back seven in pass coverage played at, at any kind now, of level. I think Bryce had a good year, and, I think, and he got better as, be, as the year went on. I'd be curious to see where Bryce is in this defense, provided that Pruitt in this defense is back next year. I, I, I think he's I, moving I, to safety. Yeah, I think there's a chance they play him more in the open field because of his I, ball skills and his ability be, to see the defense. I wouldn't be surprised by that. I'm, I mean, I'm as much as they struggled, and you already mentioned, I, I'm surprised that Key Lawrence didn't get more of a, a realistic shot at, at the nickel spot. Yeah, certainly. I, I don't disagree with that. All right, is Auburn's inability to hire their coach uh, a reflection of the coaching search climbing out there, or is it a reflection of the state of things at Auburn? Hate to say this, but I would think Auburn is more stable, attractive job than the balls, at least at this point. So how do we think we would be able to hire anyone who turned Auburn down? If a change is made, there's one guy out there who obviously Auburn didn't go after, and that's Gus Malzahn. If a change is made, would Gus be on Tennessee's radar? Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure Gus's name would be vetted out on Tennessee's radar if there were a change there. But as for the Auburn situation, um, I feel like, and both of you guys can jump in here, I think the Kevin Steele thing was was an issue in that search uh, because I think there was enough of the, the Auburn power brokers that wanted Kevin Steele to either have that job or assurances that Kevin Steele was going to remain on staff, much like you saw with Bud Foster at Virginia Tech with Justin Fuente uh, a few years ago. And I think some coaches were probably a little bit leery uh, of saying, hey, you're going to make me keep somebody and it's somebody that I know actively pursued the job, wanted the job. Is he going to believe in me and back me 100% all the way through? Or is that somebody I have to worry about because I didn't, quote, go out and hire him? I think that affected the Auburn search, uh, as well as the fact that you had some people trying to make decisions who didn't work for the University of Auburn, you know, that wasn't the AD or the president. That's my take on the Auburn situation. Auburn yeah, University hubs. Auburn, excuse me. Auburn I University. heard, I mean, I heard the same things that you did, Hubbard, about all the, you know, that it was, you know, just a cluster after the fire, after the firing, because of the boosters who, you know, helped with the buyout and then felt like they had the right to, you know, be part of the hiring process. What surprises you more, Pruitt's inability to develop players or his lack of eye for talent and recruiting? Aside from Henry T. and Eric Gray, many of his big time recruits, Darnell Wright, um, Wanye Crouch, JJ, seem destined for paper four and five stars. I I don't dis- I disagree with this. I. I- you know, have they developed them? Uh, I don't think that not as well as they could have. Uh, I, I, you know, JJ Peterson was a total bust. 
Um, I won't call Darnell a bust. I won't call Wanya a bust. I think those guys are good players. I just think you've got to have somebody pull more out of them. And, you know, I don't know. And I'm not saying Will Friend's a bad football coach. I don't, you know, I just think that, you know, sometimes maybe that they didn't jive. Um, I think there is talent on this roster. So I think Jeremy does, does get talent. I, I think that, you know, the, some of these kids have struggled, whether the offense is too complex as far as terminology or the defense is too complex. And, and, you know, I think that's a big reason. You're surprised by the Pope transfer? It's the next question. No, I, I'm not. I, I put in the Monday night chat the other night. I didn't think he'd be back. How come, AP? Did you? I mean, you think he wants to go somewhere like down or some or like a I could, wolf I, move? I could see him playing for uh, Butch Jones at Arkansas State. I mean, you know, you know, I, I just think that you know he he felt like he needed to change, and I mean, you know, Tennessee did not. Th- you know, again, somebody said, you know, said well, Tennessee lost the rest tight end. Well, that's a relative term because Tennessee didn't throw it to the tight ends a lot. Really threw it to the tight ends more at the end of the year than they did any of the last couple of years. And, you know, so, I mean, like, he, he was a big help in the run game a year ago, um, you know, and I'm not going to say he was, you know, a, a guy that didn't help because he did. But I, I just don't think that this is a I, – I said it way back when, I didn't think it was a big loss. didn't think it was a big loss, you know, that he transferred. And I love Austin Pope. I, he's a great kid knowing from, you know, when he was at Sevier County and CAK – Awesome kid, and I wish him nothing but the best. Do you feel the current level of frustration that our fan base has with this coaching staff and program is justified, or is the fans just out of touch and unrealistic as the national media portrays us to be? Listen, I mean, look, the, the bottom line is the core of this fan base, the, the people my age, a little bit younger than, than me, a little bit older than me, you know, live the 90s, live the golden years, 45 and 5. You know, um, I'm 46 years old. I don't remember the early 80 struggles, right? I mean, I, re- I remember 85. First year, I really remember Tennessee and knew, knew, knew a bunch of guys and was really dialed into it. I was in the sixth grade, I guess. Um, and then John, Johnny had good, I mean, not SEC, you know, maybe not national championship continuing years, but they were good in 89, you know, 90. Yeah. That 89 team was good. Charlie Carter. Yeah. And, yeah. So um, I just think the I think the core of the fan base has seen, you know, great. I think they've seen great Tennessee football, and yeah, I think the I think the frustrations are certainly justified. Are the expectations for this program, you know, maybe too lofty at times? Yeah, it may be. I mean, if you look at the overall history of the program, perhaps that's the case. But it's been proven that you can win big at Tennessee uh, and compete for championships and be at a a, a conference championship level on a on a semi-regular basis. So I, I don't think that's unrealistic at all. Even and I think another, harder than it's ever been. Another source of the frustration is the people that are in the age range that are bearing the biggest financial responsibility for supporting this program live through those times and know it could be done. And they're unhappy. Yeah. And, and, there, and look, there are other schools in this league, Austin, who have made coaching changes and they've worked. Tennessee's made a bunch of coaching changes the last 10 years and they haven't worked. Right. Yeah, I mean, you you go and look at you know the all SEC teams, you know that you know that they rolled out you know or early this week. Brent Arkansas had seven total guys, you know, on those teams. Tennessee had one, you know, and and this is an Arkansas team that had not won a conference game in nearly three years before Sam Pittman took over. So I mean, again, I think it's all about getting the right mesh. Um, you know, and, and, and finding the kind of the right formula, you know, and, and, and I get why the fans are frustrated, um, you know, but I also know that, you know, I mean, they, it's, it, sometimes they are a bit unrealistic, you know, I mean, I, you know, let's say, let's say Tennessee decides to move on from Jeremy Pruitt and all the fans are going to go, woo, yay, well, we got rid of Pruitt. But then if they don't hire Hugh Freeze, all these fans will be mad, and a good portion of them, because Hugh Freeze has become the new John Gruden. And, and so, you know, there are a lot of good football coaches out there. It's like the Auburn hire, you know, I mean, he has no ties to the South. There are some people down there that have some angst about that hire because, you know, they, they didn't hire the sexy name, but who's to say he's not a successful coach. Time will tell. I think Tennessee fans also look at a place like Florida, which first off is a much better job because of the recruiting base. But when they screw it up, they, they hit the reset button in a hurry. 
I mean, they moved on from Ron Zook in the blink of an eye. Same with, you know, Jim McElwain. And, you know, I'm, I guess, you know, Tennessee moved on from Dooley in a hurry. But, you know, I think that looks like commitment. Well, I mean, the, the old adage, Rob, is if you if you make a change, it's not about who you got rid of. It's about who you hire, right? So Ron Zook's a bad hire. So they get rid of him. They hire Urban Meyer, okay? You know, and then, and then they hire McElwain, you know, must champ. It doesn't work. And then they go get, you know, Dan Mullen gets there who, who's, you know, proven that, that he can coach. And, it, and, it, and it's some of it's about good fortune. You know, I mean, this, I love the adage that, you know, Alabama simply refused to take no for an answer from Nick Saban. People want to forget that Rich Rodriguez basically took the job and then turned it down. What's the fortunes of the SEC in Alabama if Rich Rodriguez doesn't back out of the job? Then Alabama resets and says whatever Nick Saban wants, he can have to come be the coach here. I mean, he was almost not the coach at Alabama. It's not like he was. It, it's not like he was the only guy they pursued. He told them no. They moved on, and they were ready to go with Rich Rodriguez, and he backed out of the job. Yeah, having a plan. I mean, the whole reason Tennessee football is in the situation has been for the past decade is because they fired a Hall of Fame coach without a plan you end up with you know lane kiffin who stiffs you after a year and then the second biggest mistake in hindsight i think was not what was you know not letting david cutcliffe bring his entire old miss staff i'm not saying tennessee would have won a national championship but i would bet my bottom dollar that they never would have gone oh and eight the sec if david cut was the head coach well and if not going that route they should have went the ohio state route which was what they did with luke fickle when jim trestle was out and said Kippy Brown, you're going to interim it for a year. Let's just try to keep the thing above water. Maybe Kippy ends up being a really good coach, and, and you want to hire him. Worst case scenario is you 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 kind of have a year to build into finding the next guy instead of hiring Derek Dooley and, and going down that road. So that's why the the whole notion that you know if they fire Jeremy in you know mid to late January, early February. To me, like that's that's weird timing as far as like you know trying to find a guy that can bring in a quality staff. All right, a few weeks ago on the podcast, when discussing some of the odd personnel decisions made by Pruitt and staff, particularly at quarterback, Austin made a comment along the lines of "Sometimes the staff overthinks the details too much." Could Austin, Brent, or Rob as well provide any additional color context to that comment? I don't want to read too much into it, but I'm just trying to better understand the way Jeremy Pruitt and his staff think and approach personnel decisions and possibly why they have struggled with personnel management in the ways that they have. I'm going to jump on this and then I'll stop. Go ahead. You, you're ready to go. I, 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 you didn't say who said this question. Can I, can I have a guess? Well, you, I don't know. You might have the computer open in front of you, but go I, ahead. I, I don't. I want to go Minnesota Vol. Nope, no. not Minnesota Vol. This not is, Minnesota Vol. I, I want to give Minnesota Vol a ton of credit. Nobody asks tougher questions to answer than that guy. Like when he asks a question, I'm like, man, that's a tough question. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, he does. He asks, I mean, he is insightful <laughs> stuff for sure. So, okay. I, I don't even remember making this comment. Um, so I don't really know what context I was talking about. Do you remember Brent? Uh, not right off the top of my head. I, I still think it's a good question though, because I would agree that, that some of their personnel decisions have been odd from the standpoint of rotating offensive linemen not playing the backup quarterbacks when they had the chance to get the backup quarterbacks on the that's, field. That's a big one. For you me. know, not key, not more key Lawrence as, as Rob alluded to just a minute ago. So, and, and look, I don't want to pick the scab on everything and micro dissect into everything that, you know, because it didn't work, that means everything was a mistake, but some of the things have been odd there. I do think there are some coaches and it's not just this staff. Some coaches are fo- fixated on, playing a guy who doesn't make a mistake versus maybe playing your most talented guy. Right. And so I think there are some times that coaches get caught up in that. I think Jim Chaney at the age where he's at in his career, probably is much more of focused on the guy, him trusting the guy to be where they're supposed to be or to know where he's supposed to go with it based than just the guy who's got the best arm or the, I, I guy, think or the guy who's got the best legs so to speak i think that's super con- i had, a, I had a, an assistant coach tell me one time and and i think this staff is like that that more than anything coaches want to know what they're going to get like if you're if you're a b-minus player but you're a b-minus every saturday 
They like that better than a guy who can be an A minus on one series and come back and be a D on another series. They want consistency so they can plan around it. And I think that's why, Austin, you've heard Jeremy Pruitt say at times, and, and, and you can feel a little bit of his frustration where he's like, we had a good call there but we messed that call up. And I think that goes back to how difficult and complicated this defense is because there's so many checks, there's so many answers to so many things. So, you know, if a guy motions one way, you know, or the splits a certain way, then all of a sudden you're playing leverage or you're playing this coverage a little bit different. There, it, it's complicated because there's solutions and answers to all of the problems out there and not just sometimes – my 11 is going to be better than your 11, right? I mean, yeah. I, I think I think when you don't have the, the the best talent, you try to scheme it up so much to help yourself that you can you can't overcomplicate it at times. You can, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I, when I, I think when I was just when I was talking about them over, you know, overthinking it, I think you just just the little things about like you know, you know, say. I mean, to me, like you know, Coach Pruitt, you know, he is so hard and fast about a guy can't be a you know, just be a gamer, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, who, who, who's our boy that does the SEC uh, on for CBS, Gary Danielson, who says there's no such thing as momentum. I mean, like, of course there is. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I just like, I think there are such thing as gamers, you know, I, I think that, you know, overthink, you know, uh, you know, a, a kid that, you know, the, I don't know. I just feel like that they ultimately like, you know, just, worry about a couple of little things that let them let it get in the way of their decision making yeah and and again I think when you don't have when you look on tape and you don't think your talent is equivalent to the team you're playing then it does become more much much more about do do my guys you know I want to play the guys who know what to do because we're going to have to outsmart the other team right because you know, Alabama's got all these weapons. And so obviously they can just go out there and, you know, their best is better. And they just kind of line up and play some one-on-one a little bit. That's not what Tennessee, you know, has, has tried to do. And I do think sometimes you can have what I proverbially call too many meetings and, and you can overcomplicate some things for people. All right. A couple more questions here uh, before we, we get out the door uh, on this thing. Uh, Brent, you continue to say uh, you think Pruitt will need to lay out a defined plan for a turnaround. Just curious what you think that looks like in the Tuesday podcast. I think you gave a couple of examples, but wanted to hear what you think that plan might look like as far as staffing, recruiting strategy, schematics, roster management, development on the field, X's and O's, et cetera, uh, or however else uh, Philip Fulmer, Randy Boyd might look at it. Um, again, I, I think that when I talk about that, it's what does your staff look like? You know, what if you're making changes, who are you hiring? Why are you hiring this guy? And it's and it's not because Jeremy Pruitt's not smart enough, but it's the it's the track record there, right? I mean, it's the fact that you hired a guy for the defensive line position who didn't make it out of the first month of the season. You know, why is that the case? Why did you why did you miss on that one? Why was he a bad fit? How did you not see that he was a bad fit when you hired him? Did you not vet him out enough? Uh, th- things like that is why I would want to know uh, specifics on the staff. Recruiting, we talked about out of the gate. Austin, I think this staff has to recruit the state of Tennessee better. And if that means moving a different position coach or a different collection of coaches into the state of Tennessee or putting more coaches in the state, well, I think I, they've got to recruit the state better. I do think it's unfair that one guy, and that's T. Martin, has the entire Nashville to Memphis. Like, you know, like locally here, like there's, you know, Cheney. I think Niedermeyer's got a source part of Chattanooga, but like those areas aren't as talent rich as Nashville and Memphis. So to me, it's unrealistic to say, Hey T man, you got all of Memphis and all the Nashville. And, you know, I mean, then you got to, you know, got to go up to Martin to see Ty Simpson and you got, you know, you know, you go down in Hardin County where Caden Pope is. I, I just think that it's unrealistic, you know, for that. I, I think you need multiple coaches. And when Pruitt first got here, multiple coaches had this state. There was like three guys that had middle Tennessee and then uh, David Johnson had Memphis. Yeah. And, and I, I just don't think, but you're right. I do that. think that they have to recruit this state way harder. And I know they want to in 2022, but I mean like, and I know they weren't crazy about this year and I, I, and I don't disagree that it was not a great year in state, but it's a bad look when you don't land any of the top 
10 or 11 guys. You land one, you land Walker Merrill, you know, you moved on from Elijah, you know, you know, down at, down at Chattanooga Baylor and, and, you know, and I, I understood why, you know, the logic, you know, in that, um, but I mean, you lost, you know, Hudson Wolf and then, you know, a bunch of the other guys, you, you chose not to really pursue very hard. And then as for the other things, schematics, Rob, for me, I would want to know what's the offensive identity. I know what your defensive identity is. Everybody in this league's playing some form of your defense, right? So you know what that is. But what's the offensive identity going to be moving forward? Because offense is the, the name of the game in the SEC right now. So that would Absolutely. be the question I would yeah. want a clear answer to. I completely agree. I mean, you, you, you wrote about it, I don't know how many times, and the 3 two, one or 10 things, I think, I think. They just – I mean, if you – if you ask 10 different people what Tennessee's offense wanted to do or what they wanted to hang their hat on, you might get 10 different answers. I just, I mean, I never saw it. I think we all thought in the preseason it was going to be a ground game because you brought back so much on the offensive line and you added Cade Mays to the mix. You get two veteran running backs and they just didn't work out that way. I mean, they couldn't, against good teams, they could not run the football. And they had some good, nice moments against Missouri, against Auburn. But, you know, in, in big time games, they were just outmatched on the line of scrimmage. I mean, so there goes your play action game. And um, yeah, I mean, they were hamstrung at quarterback. I don't think Jim Chaney ever trusted his quarterback, but you know, whose fault is that in year three? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I, all, again, all those questions are questions I would have that I would want specific answers to. All right. So this has been a bonus Christmas edition of the VolQuest.com mailbag podcast on this Christmas Eve. We run a little long here, but as you wrap up your Christmas shopping today and uh, while you're sitting around um, drinking some eggnog, it's uh, a great, uh, hopefully a, a good listen for you to uh, get you ready for your time with friends and family on this Christmas holiday. So that's going to do it for this edition of the VolQuest.com mailbag podcast brought to you by Blue Water Climate Control. Uh, we want to wish everybody out there a great and Merry Christmas. Enjoy the uh, time and 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 family and everybody stay safe and healthy and uh we got plenty of basketball coverage coming up plenty of recruiting stuff coming up we will have the war room tomorrow uh a christmas day edition oh watch your kids open your presents before you read the war room right or, or read it while you're finishing putting your toys together for your kids but on behalf of rob and austin i just want to say thanks to everybody for continuing your support of the site continue to be a part of the site and we wish everybody a merry christmas and uh, a safe and happy holiday so Thank you guys and uh, have a great holiday.